Good morning. I call to order the regular planning board meeting for November 16th, 2023. Welcome to those who have joined us in person, as well as those who may be watching online. Thank you for your interest in planning board matters. Uh, if you will, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Except for the gold print. <laughs> Madam Clerk, we do have a quorum. Ms. McCullough is out of town due to uh, work, and she's teaching a class, and so she's unable to join us electronically. So at this time, I would entertain a motion to excuse Ms. McCullough from this meeting. Mr. Pittman, we have a second. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bradley, all in favor? Thank you. Uh, next is the adjustment and approval of the agenda. Um, there is one item that we discussed last month, and so I'd like to make sure we include it under new business, and that would be um, a proposal to discuss and possibly change the December planning board uh, meeting date. And Mr. Kirkland, do you have anything to add for the tree canopy materials today? Um, not at this time. I apologize. I was out of the office yesterday, um, so I don't have printed copies for you guys. It was my intention to, to get you some. Um, if anybody uh, needs it, we can certainly uh, get it to you. It's also in the council agenda report as well, uh, and the recording of the presentation from the consultant uh, is available online as well. Okay. Uh, so I do apologize for that. If anybody wants or needs a hard copy, let me know, and I'll, I'll print one out for you, no problem. Thank you. If anybody, yeah. I'm sorry, if anybody wants one, if you would just let us know now, I can print it from here and we can okay, come up yeah. later while you're here. I, I have a copy, but. Yeah. It, I have a copy. Any, anybody else need a copy, a hard copy? Okay, yeah. great. Okay, Thanks. good, thank you. Hey, so, some trees. So uh, I made the motion to um, add discussion and possible change of the December meeting date. Is there a second? I second. Mr. Brooks, all in favor? Okay, thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, approval of the minutes from the October 19th regular meeting. Those minutes are found starting on page four of your agenda packet. Are there any corrections, modifications, or edits to the minutes? Mr. Pittman? No Mr. Purser? Ms. Morgan? Mr. Bradley? Good. Mr. Brooks? No, ma'am. Okay, hearing no amendments, uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the October 19th regular meeting? I make a motion to approve. Bradley, second. I Mr. second. Brooks, all in favor? Thank you. And then next we have the approval of the minutes from the October 24th, 2023 special meeting. Those minutes are found starting on page seven of your agenda packet. Um, Ms. McCullough made a um, ask for a clarification to Madam Clerk, and um, she has made that clarification. So thank you very much for that. Does anyone else have anything, um, Mr. Brooks, Mr. Bradley, Ms. Morgan, Mr. Purser, Mr. Pittman? Okay, I just have one thing. It's um, it's a I'm sure it's, it's just a small typo <coughs> on page nine, recreational uses, which is the second full paragraph down. Um, it says Mr. Morgan, and I'm sure that's supposed it's to be Miss Morgan. <laughs> so just that correction. So is there a motion then to um, approve the minutes as amended? Ms. Morgan, we have a second. second. Mr. Bradley, all in favor? Very much. We now have our... Um, public comment period. Um, if there is anybody who wishes to speak, just a reminder that you'll have three minutes and please state your name and address when you come to the podium. Um, anyone in the audience wish to speak today? Okay. Hearing no one, we'll move on. So we're very happy to have uh, with us today Wes McLeod. Wes is the local government services director with the Cape Fear 
Council of Governments, and uh, he will be providing a planning board training session for us. Uh, Wes did this for us last year, and I found the information quite helpful. Um, Wes, how would you like us to address questions? You want us to hold them to the end, or you want to be interactive and... Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, this can be informal, so okay. uh, just jump right in there. Uh, I've, I've been here and done this several times, so as questions come up, just please do ask them. Okay. And that, that goes for Matt as well, <laughs> and or comments that Matt may have, or Lisa, or you guys, um, please do. Okay, very good. It's all yours, sir. All right, thank you all. Uh, as Madam Chair noted, I'm the Local Government Services Director uh, for Cape Fear Council of Governments. Um, Cape Fear Council of Governments serves four counties in the region, Pender County, New Hanover County, Brunswick, and Columbus County. Um, and we do, uh, we provide these trainings for planning boards, governing boards, boards of adjustments, um, specifically related to planning and uh, planning and zoning. Uh, rules and regulations. So uh, we're accustomed to doing this. Um, and of course, I've uh, worked with the town here over um, a number of years on, on various projects. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here today to provide this training for you. Um, we'll jump right in here um, just with understanding some foundational uh, items. Uh, so specifically in terms of legal context for our local governments, um, our local governments are creatures of the state and have no inherent powers. And across the U.S., there's two different types of states. There's home rule states and Dillon's rule states. Home rule states, the local governments have very broad authority to, to essentially do whatever they want, enact any rules, regulations, laws that they want to, so long as they don't violate their state or federal constitution. Conversely, in Dillon's rural states, local governments only have those powers that are expressly granted to them by their legislatures. In, you know, in, in our case, that would be our North Carolina General Assembly. North Carolina is a hybrid of those two. Um, we are uh, grant our local governments, the town of Oak Island, is granted fairly broad authority uh, to enact rules, regulations, laws, etc. cetera. Uh, however, um, as some of you may know, our General Assembly will be very quick to tell us when we have overstepped uh, those bounds. And so um, part of the uh, material that we're going to discuss today talks a little bit about what those, what those bounds are. Um, and over the years, particularly in the past decade, uh, the General Assembly has been fairly active um, in legislating uh, preemptions uh, as it relates to our zoning rules and development rules. Um, and at least from my perspective, uh, I don't anticipate that to slow down uh, anymore. Um, while in the past it's been kind of more uh, one-sided approach to preempting uh, regulations uh, for our local governments, now um, there's a bit of a coalescing around uh, housing affordability and any sort of impediments that zoning is creating uh, uh, from that front. And so um, I would anticipate to continue uh, for Matt and or myself uh, to be coming to you guys in the next years with new rules and regulations that, that are happening uh, ar around uh, zoning. Okay. So uh, let's talk about land use decisions. There are four types. Uh, the first being legislative. These are your policy decisions. These are under the authority of the governing board. In this case, the town of Oak Island Town Council. Um, those decisions are things like adopting the budget, approving a, a, an annexation, um, and then, of course, more commonly, uh, any time the town council were to approve a text amendment, uh, ordinance change, zoning map amendment, um, et cetera. You guys do have some involvement in legislative decisions for text amendments and rezonings, but it's only an advisory capacity. Uh, you're not the final decision maker of those. The key with legislative decisions um, is that um, 
broad public input can go into those. That's where you have a public hearing. Anybody can show up and speak their piece about uh, an, an action, a legislative action before the town council. Town council is welcome to take into account any of that public comment as, as well in terms of making their decision. Second is advisory. These are not final decisions. These are, of course, therefore less regulated and they are typically a function of the planning board uh, and or staff. These are recommendations on uh, site plans, subdivision plats, uh, and of course mandatory advisory recommendations on text amendments or zoning map amendments. Um, they're not subject to any type of appeal or recourse, so if I am mad as a citizen uh, or a developer at you guys advisory recommendation on a text amendment, I can't bring some type of court action or appeal it to the Board of Adjustment. Nothing has actually happened. All, all you've actually done is made an advisory recommendation. Third is administrative. These are routine activities that are typically handled by professional staff, but also sometimes the planning board or governing board. Uh, this is when any time um, the planning department Downstairs, Development Services Department issues a zoning permit, a sign permit. Uh, also, they may approve a site plan for just a single family house. There's also administrative decisions here in the town of Oak Island that are subject to approval by the town council. Those are certain subdivision plats and certain site plans as well. The key with those is there, there's no discretion that happens in those. If the site plan or the subdivision meets the terms of the ordinance, the local government is bound to approve it. There's a certain inherent amount of rights that are afforded to the property owner. Hey, I've met, I've met the, the terms that you guys have agreed to and written in writing, so you have to approve this plan. Um, it can get tricky sometimes, administrative decisions, if um, constituents or citizens show up and they're upset about something. There's really no, um, no way to uh, add discretion to those, uh, those types of decisions. For example, the planning board or the town council can't say, hey, well, I know that the ordinance allows for a minimum lot size of 10,000 square feet, but we really like 20,000 square foot lots. We, 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 we would prefer to approve it that way. Can't really do that. Uh, they, they're allowed and, and permitted to have a 10,000 square foot lot. Um, could you ask that voluntarily? Maybe, uh, but I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, get into a habit of doing so. What you should do instead is change the ordinance to 20,000 sometime before, uh, before it ever gets to that point. Those decisions are subject to an appeal, either at the Superior Court level or Board of Adjustments. So if it's a staff level decision where they issue a zoning permit or deny a zoning permit, um, then that can be appealed to, to the town's Board of Adjustment. Yes, sir. Question on the administration. Yep. If somebody comes up and we don't like it or whatever, yep. you know, can you, postpone a decision on it until you change the rule and then they come back? No. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that... Y you could try, but you'd be in direct <laughs> violation of the law. Okay. I just want... I've heard things, so I just wanted to make sure that... And we'll talk a little bit about vested rights as well um, and, and permit choice, which that specifically entails. There is a whole host of uh, case law and rules about that. Um, a lot of which have been put in place, tweaked, modified over the last decade, and that's one of the most litigated things that's happened uh, because oftentimes a, a local government will find themselves in court over precisely that. Okay, the fourth is quasi-judicial. We are not here to talk about quasi-judicial. I have done trainings for this uh, town's Board of Adjustment on that, but these are the most complicated uh, types of decisions of the four, uh, you, you are in a you are, conduct a spe special hearing. It's called an evidentiary hearing. It's basically a mini functions like a mini courtroom, um, and the, the key is that you're gathering facts and evidence um, under oath, and 
there are very specific requirements for how those decisions are to be made. Um, that those uh, those are relegated to your special or your special use permits, variances and appeals. So here in Oak Island, your town council uh, here's your special use permits, and when they do that, they go into uh, a separate quasi judicial or evidentiary hearing. Um, and it really just depends on the local government who's responsible for doing those. Some places, all those decisions are under the purview of the Board of Adjustment. Some places, the planning board may do special use permits. Um, it, it, it really depends. I will say that uh, variances and appeals, though, are always under the purview of the Board of Adjustment. Okay. All right, planning board basics. Um, and a lot of this is comes straight from the statute, chapter 160D-301. Um, depending on the local government, it may be called the planning board, the planning commission, the zoning board, the planning and zoning board, the planning and zoning commission, but it's all the same thing. You can call yourself whatever you want. It's the planning board. Um, a local government may establish a, a planning board in order to enact zoning powers. <clears throat> There's a minimum of three members required. After that, you can sort of make up how many members you want. You can have nine members if you want. That, that's, that's a lot, though. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily advise uh, that. Um, all of your meetings are subject to uh, statutory open meeting requirements. But some of the other details are left up to the discretion of the local governments, the number of members, um, if non-residents can participate. Over the years, we've had, it, although it's changed, but um, for a long time, a number of our beach towns would allow non-residents to participate just because they could not fill uh, a planning board with their uh, with their residents. Um, and then you can establish qualifications, terms, vacancies, attendance, et cetera. And those are all in your planning board bylaws. Talk about some of your authorities. Again, these are right from the statute. First uh, is in regards to um, preparing, reviewing, maintaining, or mon monitoring and updating uh, a town's comprehensive plan and any other plans that may be deemed appropriate. I believe the town is going to be embarking on this process here in the near future. Comprehensive plans are, of course, now um, a requirement to uh, maintain zoning authority throughout North Carolina. Second, facilitating and coordinating citizen engagement and participation in the planning process. Third, developing and recommended policies, ordinance, development regulations, administrative procedures, uh, et cetera. You guys, most of our local governments in the region, one, you guys aren't actually writing these plans. Remember, these, these rules and regulations were put into place a long time ago before there may have ever been a MAT or a ME to participate, and you guys actually may have been writing these. But one of the things that our planning boards do a lot of is um, modifying our ordinances and helping uh, and working with staff to do that. Uh, that that's one of the things that uh, our planning boards spend the most time doing. Fourth, advising the governing board concerning implementation of plans, including but not limited, the review and comment on all zoning text and re map amendments. That means that's a rezoning as required. So any ordinance amendment or any rezoning has to come to you guys uh, for an advisory recommendation and a statement of its consistency with your most recently adopted comprehensive plan. Fifth, exercise any functions in the administration and enforcement of various means for carrying out plans that the governing board may direct. Luckily for you guys, you don't have to play code enforcement officer. We do in the region have one or two of our local governments that there is a member of the planning board that also participates in code enforcement. Um, I don't know, Matt may be happy to have one of you guys serve in that role, <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't volunteer yourself. <laughs> To provide a preliminary form for review of quasi-judicial decisions, and this is a new addition to the statute, provided that no part of the form or recommendation may be used as a basis for the deciding board. Uh, and remind me, Matt, uh, it, are you all, do you all participate? Okay, not anymore. Okay, good. Um, 
Thank you. And then uh, seven, to perform any other related duties that the governing board may direct. So the governing board may say, hey, and I, you know, can you guys look at our tree policy or our parking plans, whatever it may be, uh, and they, they will give you guys an initiative to work on. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. So what would be the purpose of providing a preliminary forum for review of quasi-judicial decisions if no part of the forum or recommendation may be used as a basis for the deciding board? That, that is a great question. Um, so I'm just curious. It, it, historically, uh, and I would say if, if I had to guess across the region, uh, let's just say our beach towns, um, probably 90% of them uh, for special use permits, there was always a a review and a recommendation that happened at the planning board stage. Um, that uh, still exists in a great number of them, and I have been trying to um, take that authority away from, help, it, help them take that authority away because it creates a, a tremendous uh, potential for conflicts down the road. Um, our, this is one of the things that our legislature has now said, okay guys, if you're gonna do this, we don't really like it, but if you're going to do it, it is meaningless. You can still, uh, you can still have that effectively time-wasting effort if you want, um, but you can't. It can't take be taken into account at the next stage. And so they haven't said yet can't do it. But I would anticipate that that would be coming down down the road. So does that help answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I guess it probably, you know, gives people the feeling that they have a voice that's correct <laughs> the illusion, and I that, say. that's correct and bef you know and I will say that there's there's much more involvement with legal counsel in these things than than and this is a generalized statement than there used to be and so the I believe the purpose you know maybe 20 years ago was to allow for some true um, dialogue and input on these before it really got to the council uh, but what is ha what what's transpired is is the planning board gets involved uh, to a level that they really shouldn't be involved, um, and it it creates also a, a, a bunch of potential conflicts for the governing board. There's not supposed to be ex parte communication in these things. Uh, that creates an issue with then your governing board having a fixed opinion prior to that hearing. So technically in a quasi-judicial hearing, all the evidence is supposed to be presented at once, at one time. Well, that's really difficult if you've got a preliminary forum and it occurs. And more importantly, for our planning boards, well, are we actually supposed to go into a hearing, or are we just are we just looking at this and asking questions? And so it creates a host of a host of questions that, uh, and and particularly a, a very big legal gray area um, for not only the local government but but the applicant as well, and potentially waste you guys' time. Matt, anything you want to add to that? No, you said everything I would say about it, frankly. Okay. <laughs> Having done those in other positions in the past, as you said, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, it, uh, the same thing applies. You, you know, the quasi-judicial hearing is the hearing where all the evidence is done. And uh, as he mentioned, if you have, if the planning board makes a recommendation and council is not supposed to have an opinion prior to actually getting all the evidence and that opinion is published in the minutes, et cetera, and y'all guys, the planning board's representatives of the town, uh, that creates some potential conflicts down the road should council decide one way or another. Yeah, the county I came from, I was on the planning board. We did have quasi-judicial hearings in the planning board meeting mm -hmm. because we had the authority for the variances and stuff. It, it's, it's not fun. No. Because it went from us to another quasi-judicial in front of the county commissioners. So it was like a double, mm -hmm. a double stern of the fire, I guess, would be the right way to say it. That's right. Yep. Um, so, yeah, what, we can talk more about that. Any questions you have about that, just, just bring it up as, as we go. All right. 
Um, I've touched on some of these, but just these are all boiled down sort of into one page here. What are some of the local approval authorities, um, ordinance text amendments and zoning map amendments, planning board, uh, recommendation governing board for final approval, statement of planned consistency is required. Um, and then one thing is, you know, to remember that app, the applicant does not necessarily have a right to an amendment. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's a legislative decision. It's, it's up to you guys and it's up to them to provide reasoning and justification for why their amendment text or zoning map amendment makes sense. Um, appeal or a variance is always going to be under the purview of the Board of Adjustment. Special use permit. Um, can either be under the purview of the governing board, planning board, or board of adjustment. We have very few local governments in the region that, that special use permits are, are under the purview of the planning board. Um, in fact, I think we only have one. Um, we do have a couple that that authority is vested in the board of adjustment. Um, and I think that uh, uh, it's, it's actually a, a beneficial way to handle those. Um, it can be very difficult, and I don't think we have any council here, or maybe one new council member here. It can be very difficult for uh, our governing board members to uh, put on their quasi-judicial hat uh, from their, you know, elected official hat, because they've got citizens that are mad about this, that, or the other, um, and unless they have standing, unless they're providing, you, you know, um, factual evidence, you really can't listen to your, your voters. And so that's why it's particularly problematic to have the special use permits under the purview of the governing board. But it's something that our governing boards, they want to maintain that authority. Chris, can I ask one question? Yes, ma'am. Um, can you be, um, can you explain what kind of appeals go to the Board of Adjustment versus yes. what would maybe go to Superior Court? Yes, great question. So any appeal that if, if uh, you know, an appeal, say someone uh, is appealing a, a notice of violation or, a, um, a, you know, a denied zoning permit or the issuance of a building permit, anything that is uh, issued by staff goes to the Board of Adjustment. If there is a item that is approved by town council, um, especially a subdivision plat, it would go to superior court. I'm not sure how your ordinance reads on site plans, but does it say site plans that are under the purview of, so, and then site plans also that are approved to town council, if someone wants to appeal that, that goes directly to superior court. Does that help answer the question? Um, and, and just for everyone's edification, when it goes to superior court and it's appeal, you know, it's not like a full-blown um, court case. It, effectively, the judge just reviews the record and understands, okay, well, did the local government um, either grant this approval based on the terms of the ordinance? That, and, and if so, then that's fine. You know, I will up, the decision will be upheld. Or alternatively, did they deny this? However, the applicant actually met the terms of the ordinance then I'm going to overturn that decision or remand it back to the local government and require them to issue it. Um, the one distinct, one new thing that's happened here recently is that uh, now attorney's fees for those particular cases will have to be paid by the local government. And that was not the case until, I think, two years ago. Um, and so our local governments have tried to get a bit wiser about things to the degree that we can uh, so that we don't uh, incur costs that we shouldn't otherwise be incurring. Um, so major subdivision, subdivisions have preliminary and final plat and minor subdivisions uh, also, depending on the subdivision type, may have a preliminary and a final plat. But here, uh, major subdivision, both pre preliminary and final, are town council, correct? Or no, is that changed now? Mm -hmm. Just preliminary, okay. Uh, and then minor subdivisions, uh, same as above, non-discretionary administrative review by staff or whatever board it's directed to. So you guys can, you know, the, the bottom three items, the local government can choose sort of who's responsible for those. 
town staff can't issue a special use permit, but special use permit can be issued by one of three boards. Oak Island Planning Board Responsibility Advisory Recommendation for Text or Zoning Map Amendments. Um, I do want to point out that, that the Town Council can act if there's been no action by this board within a period of, of 30 days. Um, that doesn't come into play, but it's in the statute. Um, and then, is this still correct? Advisory recommendation for major site plans and major subdivision preliminary plats. So, um, and this is once you once you guys get these, you, you're in the ordinance. There's a requirement for for 45 days um, to to send it to town council. And when you are receiving this, you know it should have already been reviewed by staff, made sure that all the all the standards have been met. Um, made sure that they've got all the requirements of the ordinance met. So you guys shouldn't basically be getting what staff initially gets. You, you guys, once you guys get a site plan or a preliminary subdivision plat, it's already been, I don't know, through multiple iterations to make sure all the requirements of the, of the ordinance um, have been met. Um, I know that one of the things that we talked about when we did the UDO audit was potentially granting you all some approval authority for subdivision plats. I don't know where that is at the moment, but that's for now your, your responsibility. Okay, let's just talk quickly about text and zoning map amendments. All proposed amendments to a land use ordinance or the zoning map must be submitted to the planning board for review and comment. Um, and then the planning board must provide a written recommendation addressing plan consistency, whether the proposed amendment is consistent with any adopted comprehensive plan or other adopted applicable plan. Uh, another key point here that sometimes folks get um, a little bit confused with is the council can choose base their decision, they don't have to base their decision on, on you all's decision. So if you guys uh, make a recommendation to approve a text amendment, town council can, can choose whatever they want. They can choose to deny it or they can align their decision um, with yours. That consistency statement, um, it's, it's not your responsibility to prepare. You, any of the members of the board are welcome to, uh, you know, prepare a consistency statement, but that's going to be Staff's always going to prepare those and have an option for you um, uh, when when that gets when that when those items get to you. Just talk about some key considerations in terms of zoning in general, and I think you guys all probably understand these, but it's always good to go through these. Um, what are some things that are not appropriate to consider? You know who the ac applicant, you know, what's the applicant's or the occupant's identity? You know, is it a, is it a chain, for example? That's a, that's a thing that comes up often. Because um, remember, we're dealing with, with the use. Um, and property ownership, is it going to be an owner-occupied product or is it going to be a, a, a for-rent product? Um, occupancy, are they going to be low or high income uh, occupants? And then one thing that you know, often comes up uh, more than you would think is uh, a planning board or a town council may question whether or not a project is going to be profitable or whether the numbers make sense. That, you know, is not the responsibility of, of for us, right? We're, we're, we're trying to make sure that the approval aligns with the ordinance requirements or align, if it's a legislative approval, somehow aligns with our guidance in the comprehensive plan. Someone wants to go embark on something that's going to lose a bunch of money. That's on them. That's not our. That's not our job. Um, in North Carolina, uh, property rights um, hold uh, a pretty, pretty fair amount of weight, and so there are a number of um, uh, statutes in regard to. Um, statutory common law vesting permit choice type items um, that are afforded to folks. So um, that the question earlier was, well, what if I come in with an application 
and you guys say, oh my God, I can't believe that, that, they're, that he's allowed to do that. That's the worst thing that's ever happened to the town. We got to change that rule tomorrow and we're going to not allow him to, you know, to proceed. Well, in, in, in North Carolina general statutes, I am allowed to proceed so long as I've got a complete application um, with my proposal, regardless of whatever changes you guys uh, decide to make after the fact. Someone that comes in after me, they cannot do the same thing if you do, in fact, change the rules, but I'm allowed to proceed as is. Um, I've mentioned this before, um, must approve certain development proposals if all ordinance standards are met. This includes site plans, zoning change of use, sign permits, or, or subdivision plats. And I know, again, this is something that's difficult for folks. We ju I just had one of these, um, in fact, the same proposal that's been denied twice and it's gone to Superior Court twice now uh, for subdivision in, in Columbus County. And the, uh, I can tell you that the, um, the, the county's legal counsel is, uh, <laughs> his quote is, this is not a good case and this is not a good way to proceed. We're going to lose again. Uh, because you can't, you can't win if someone comes forward with a, with a proposal that meets the ordinance standards. It's, you either approve it or a judge is gonna approve it, one or the other. There are uh, certain items that are afforded some level of special zoning considerations, um, signs, manufactured housing, and also now all the way up to quadplex ha housing. You cannot regulate the design of those or impose a moratorium to develop ordinances. And so signs, there was a Supreme Court case, um, it's probably six years ago now, that basically said that if you guys are gonna have sign regulations, they have to be content neutral. In other words, all of our local governments, you know, historically had a rule that, that, that um, had in place for real estate signs or political signs or certain type of business signs. Well, the Supreme Court said you, you can't single out different sign types, but what you can do is regulate the size um, and, the, and the height and et cetera uh, and lighting, but you can't regulate the content. Manufacture, manufactured housing is another one. Um, in North Carolina, we cannot exclude those from our local jurisdictions, nor can we have a requirement that they be of a certain age. Um, that was something that was in place in a number of our local governments, said you, if you're going to bring in a manufactured house, it's got to be at least 10 years uh, older or newer. Can't do that uh, anymore. Um, and then very recently, uh, there's been a further um, extension of preemptions for design of residential structures. And so in the past, we've been unable to regulate uh, the design of one and two family structures that's been now extended all the way to uh, triplexes and quadplexes as well. Okay. We'll talk briefly about subdivision. You know, that's something, a subject that you guys are, I would anticipate, going to have more and more subdivisions uh, underway here. I don't know how many you guys have in the queue. Is there, do you know, none for the moment? Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> um, I mentioned this prior, unless it's approved by a quasi-judicial process, subdivision approval is administrative and should be based only on adherence to objective standards in the ordinance. Subdivision approval is not the time to decide whether the project is, is desired. The, de the zoning determines what, where, and what density development may locate. Um, and it is generally approved by right if it conforms to the ordinance standards. We do have some local governments um, west of us that uh, do have quasi-judicial subdivision approval. Uh, that almost no one here in our region does that. Um, but again, if, if you guys don't like the lot size or setbacks or other things that are afforded to folks to come in uh, with subdivision approvals, you need to change the, the standards and the ordinance, not mandate the standards for someone's proposal that comes in the door. Um, what are some appropriate considerations if they're included in the ordinance standards? <coughs> um, 
requirements for um, infrastructure to support uh, that subdivision, water, sewer, stormwater, you know, whether or not streets can be public or private, the amount of open space that has to accompany um, that subdivision approval, um, and or um, whether or not they're required to put in street lights, things like that can all be uh, included in your ordinance standards. Uh, but if, for example, again, if you don't have a provision in there for street lights and you guys say, hey, I want street lights, me as a developer can say, I'm not doing it. Uh, I could voluntarily do it, but I'm not doing it. I, I can't be mandated to add street lights if it's not in your ordinance. What are some inappropriate considerations generally? Um, we can't get into the business of housing size. Um, and in fact, now uh, we're no longer even allowed to set a minimum housing size. That was something that was allowable for a great number of years. Um, but the General Assembly has now said you can't set a minimum dwelling unit size any, anymore. Um, in fact, Bowling Spring Lakes had, was one of the local governments that had that in place for many, many years. Um, uh, based on based on the particular zoning district, they're not allowed to do that anymore. Um, so you also can't get into the business of property values, of the characteristics of the residents, uh, et cetera, school capacity, um, or uh, out, uh, are, are providing for uh, a new school uh, as well. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> so we can have uh, ordinance standards that a subdivision will have homeowners association responsibilities. Um, is that what I'm reading here correctly? Yes. There's a fine line, and if I recall in your ordinance, there is an a bunch of HOA stuff that we sort of took out, correct? Um, so you, ca you can, there's no necessarily, to my knowledge, there's no limit on the degree to which you want to go down a rabbit hole on, on establishing an HOA and the, and the various roles surrounding it. I would highly advise against, you know, trying to de facto write in an HOA bylaw for every subdivision that, that, that comes in uh, in town. Um, but by nature of now our stormwater rules, it is almost uh, a, a de facto requirement that an HOA has to be established in some sort of way to maintain uh, the mandatory stormwater system that's in place. Um, I'm just asking because <clears throat> Uh, not not here at Oak Island uh, specifically, but across North Carolina, we have so many subdivisions with no HOA or inactive HOA, and and then road maintenance becomes an issue. Yep. So um, after the subdivision is approved and developed, does the town have any power to? or responsibility to make sure that the HOA is doing what they're supposed to be doing? Or? So as it relates specifically to road maintenance, it's one of the biggest issues in our region and across North Carolina. And that's one of the things that um, I have worked with trying to come up with the best policies and procedures for how the roads are handled, um, in my general opinion. Uh, it's oftentimes best to just strictly require public streets and the town takes over the street once they know um, that it's been installed properly uh, because from there you can maintain it appropriately. However, that is a also big line on a maintenance uh, capital expenditure for our local governments. Um, so it is a difficult balance for, hey, are, do we local government, we're going to know that we're going to take over the street and maintain it now even though it's going to be a line item or on our budget, or are we going to allow private streets, hope that the HOA maintains it, and then 12, 15 years down the road, there's going to be a room full of citizens that are in here, and they're asking the council to take over their road, um, and it's then become dilapidated. There's a ton of money that's going to go have to put in it, be put in it, and what happens, not all the time, 
but lots of time is local government says, fine, we'll take over your road. And so they, they end up having the expense anyway. That's right. And so one of the other things that I've, we, I've helped local governments put into play is policies, specific policies on how and when you are to accept a road um, and any of the, you know, being very clear on, okay, if we're going to take over a road, then it needs to meet these standards and or you need to establish some type of improvement district and, and fund, you know, separate tax, uh, tax burden will be placed on these owners. It's a whole complicated thing. Um, That's fine, there's nice. really no silver bullet to it. Um, and I don't know, I'll, I'll ask Matt, I don't know what you guys sort of current perspective is uh, for roads at the moment. Yeah, uh, so the town allows public and private in certain situations uh, based on our subdivision ordinances. So if they meet those requirements, uh, it, it's you know just like any other subdivision approval. If, if you're uh, there's standards for a private road. If you meet those, you're you're allowed to install a private road. We have some here in the town uh, on the mainland section. I believe we have a few private roads that are under uh, HOA management and maintenance um i mean like Wes, uh, i've dealt with this in many other jurisdictions uh we had some interesting approaches that were later stripped out by the general assembly uh where uh one jurisdiction i worked with withheld permits until the road was taken over by the state or hoa and uh the state said you can't withhold permits for an off-site issue and the, the street is not technically part of the lot, so I can't, we, that program got uh, kind of wiped out. Um, but it, it is a tricky issue for sure uh, and something that we, we really uh, keep an eye on. I've also worked in jurisdictions that, like Wes said, only allowed public roads and new development for that exact problem. But once again, it, it is a balancing act. If you've got a lot of new roads coming in, um, the you have to plan for that appropriately, even if you have a, even if you install it to a 30 year maintenance level, uh, you know, that's going to be a big expense in 30 years that uh, council has to budget for appropriately. Um, for your kind of your initial question about if you have a subdivision regulation that relates to an HOA and the HOA goes away after that, that's an extremely tricky problem because once that plat signed and recorded at the register of deeds, I, I can't go unrecorded at the register of deeds at that subdivisions there. So I'm really not sure what type of authority the town would have after the fact. Um, or so it like seems that. to me like requiring the public road is really the only way to prevent problems down the road. Yes, yes. And or the other thing that for our local governments that we do that do allow private roads, there's all types of disclosures in there and, and we require certifications on the plat that basically said this road is private. Town is not ever taking this over, period. <laughs> uh, I don't care what you say. <laughs> That's basically what the certificate says and um, and it's very very clear so that when those folks do show up and they're angry, the town can at least say, hey, we told you this is the rules. Um, and you can also mandate some disclosure. There's, there's mandated, mandated disclosures, obviously, um, that uh, by, by NC Realtors Association for anyone that buys in a, um, in a subdivision with a private road that discloses that the roads are private and, 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 and the maintenance requirements. Sometimes it still doesn't matter, but uh, yeah, I, that's one of the more and one of the biggest liabilities for our local governments. And one of the things that when I am helping folks on ordinances, we try to key in on um, and make sure that we've got it tightened up as as best we can. Thank you. Can I ask one question? Yes, sir. When you say inappropriate considerations generally, and then you list housing side, you said you can't limit. A minimum housing side, but you, but the maximum everything else you can limit. We're at at present uh, <laughs> today. We are allowed to put a cap on housing size. Um, that could change tomorrow, uh, but at present today we're allowed to set a, a, and and that is a zoning 
it, that that's a zoning rule, uh, but it would be obviously tied to the, to potentially the creation of a lot and what someone could build on that lot. Okay. Um, conditions, if any, should be directly tied to satisfying the ordinance requirements. So you guys can't just say, for example, um, we want everyone to have uh, 13 live oaks because we like them and we're going to condition your approval on that. Um, but you can say if for some reason the, the plat gets to you and let's say that everything else is met but the plat shows four foot sidewalks but five foot sidewalks are required, the, the planning board can say we make a recommendation to approve this subject to the, the modification of your sidewalk from four to five feet. And so there are on occasion uh, times that you may get a plat that not everything is, is, is as it should be. Um, and sometimes it's difficult for us working with the engineer that you may tell them something 13 times and they don't do it. Um, it's finally reached a point that, all right, we got to move it on. And the staff report may say, hey, uh, planning board, you're okay to, to approve this, but do know that you should make your recommendation subject to X, Y, and Z. And X, Y, and Z will all relate to standards in the ordinance that maybe haven't been met. Anything you want to add to that? No, yeah, I mean, that's exactly how we handle it. Um, if there's a condition that's either, like we said, been reiterated to them several times, um, you know, we do want to respect due process since staff's not the final approval on, on a major subdivision or something like that. So uh, in those instances, we would uh, give you a couple of options as far as how you could proceed either with the recommendation of denial because it doesn't meet the standards of the ordinance or let you know that it, if you feel inclined to approve it, you should condition it on meeting the ordinance criteria that we, that it doesn't meet currently. Yep. Okay. Um, plat versus site plan. Site plan is, is so let's, let's imagine that the town hall that we're in today uh, didn't exist and is just a piece of property, a lot. Uh, site plan, there would be a site plan for this town hall and how it, how it relates to setbacks what the parking requirements are, all those types of things would be on a site plan. A plat is a plan to divide land and create lots, but not necessarily put structures on those. So those are two fundamental uh, differences. Uh, there's two, two, two types of uh, approval types there. Um, so yeah, and, and in general, I would say in general, your subdivisions are your more complicated uh, approval types site plans can be complicated, but it's you know it's one lot. It's it's typically one structure or a number of structures, and you make sure that their buffer requirements in their parking, etc. Whereas a subdivision has a lot more moving parts, um, and um, there's also various phases uh, for a subdivision plat before it ever gets to the register of deeds for recording. There may be a sketch plat that's required in some local governments, then a preliminary plat. The preliminary outlines all of the required infrastructure to support that development, roads, water, sewer, sidewalks, open space, recreation, uh, amenities, etc. That all gets approved um, and then that allows the individual to go in and actually start constructing the infrastructure uh, or bonding it before they actually come in for a final plat, which then gets approved uh, by the local government and then gets recorded. And from there, someone can actually go and sell lots to a third party. So uh, just wanna point that difference out. Let's talk a little bit about vested rights. Um, this is a topic that comes up, um, has been coming up more and more often. Um, across our region. Um, there's two types that we deal with, and those being statutory and common law vested rights. So statutory vested rights are based on a site-specific vesting plan, and they are time limited. And that time may be anywhere from two to seven years, depending on the project. Um, 
And so there's no work or investment is required on behalf of the developer to maintain statutory vesting. So there is uh, what's called a multi-phase development plan. That's a plan that is to contemplate to be completed in phases. It's over 25 acres. And if I have an approval type that meets that definition per the statute, then I am automatically vested uh, for a period of seven years. And I can do nothing. I can sit on my hands for uh, six years and 364 days, and you guys have no right to um, try to modify or question my, my approval. Um, that means on if it's a site plan, uh, for example, this is just a hypothetical example, that means on, on that, that day 364 of the six years, I can come in here and apply for a building permit, and the town is bound to uh, grant my building permit to proceed. Um, you, the town is all, this town has also dealt with extension of statutory vested rights as well. Typically, there, the, lots of times there's two years involved. There's, the multi-phase has come into play in the last couple years. But local government can also extend those statutory vesting rights. And they're not bound to do so, but they're allowed to do that. Um, and the key with it, with vesting rights, vested rights, do you guys sort of understand the principle of vested rights? Maybe I see some heads nodding. But I will just explain very simple terms. If I have a piece of property and I'm, I'm allowed to build at 10 units an acre, I get a project that's approved at 10 units an acre and the town changes it to it now be four units an acre, I'm still allowed to do 10 units an acre subject to my vested rights. Right, okay. That's, that's the, the principle of, of vested rights. Second type, which is a bit more complicated, or is more complicated, is common law vested rights. And those are established by substantial expenditures relying in good faith on a valid governmental permit. Um, those are authorized in case law. Uh, however, um, whether or not the initial determination of whether or not someone has achieved common law vested rights is under the purview of administrative staff. And so if there is a question of whether or not someone has triggered or passed the threshold to uh, have common law vested rights, staff can make that initial determination, which can then be appealed uh, by the Board of Adjustment with, by someone with legal standing. I will say that um, vested rights have become a, a very hot topic. Um, and one of the things that the legislature is very quick to, um, uh, to uh, um, penalize our local governments for messing with that the General Assembly has been very clear that we are not okay with you guys pulling the rug out from underneath somebody because you don't like something. Um, and so it's also a, a sore subject for some of our citizens in the region that, you know, may think that a, a previous approval is no longer valid, um, despite whether or not it is. Um, I would say that Questions surrounding that need to always go to um, town staff uh, as, as a first uh, measure. Questions about vested rights. All right, conflict of interest. Um, you guys are now luckily have your own conflict of interest standards and you, and you didn't until a couple years ago. Um, these are all in Chapter 160D-109. You can see there, appointed boards um, shall not vote on any advisory or legislative decision regarding a development regulation uh, where, uh, where you're reasonably likely to have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact uh, on the member. Um, and you also obviously can't 
vote on a, uh, a, a matter that is in relation to your own property is also in there, but I think that goes without saying. Um, nor can you vote on some, something where you have a, a familial, a close familial relationship with somebody, and, and that means spouse, parent, child, brother, sister, et cetera. Um, and then um, the member must abstain from voting, but may, to, may, may participate in the deliberations. Uh, I, I would not advise uh, on that. You know, I would advise if there is a conflict that it's probably best to go sit in the audience um, I mean, you can technically you're allowed to, to engage in deliberations, but I think that that's probably a bad idea. Interesting thing about the familial relationship, if anyone knows the history of our uh, beach towns here in North Carolina, there's no way that anyone would have built anything because everyone would have had a conflict be because family members were on the boards, they were doing the work. Anyways, that's just a... What's associational? That's a very good question, um, and I don't really have a good answer for you on what that would mean. If you, yeah, th so th this is this comes up at any school of government training ever when this topic comes up, and even the experts in the school of government will tell you, well, we don't know yet. Is uh, there hasn't really been any case law on? Is that if you're both members of the Elks Club together, or are you friends, or uh, that it just hasn't been that? Like uh, Wes said, up until a couple of years ago, this this didn't exist for appointed boards, and there hasn't really been much case law about it one way or another. Um, usually, best to err on the side of caution if you think you might fall under something like that. But uh, there hasn't been many challenges to it yet. So. Um, the the procedure, the advisable procedure, is if you if you see something in the packet, like oh man, I might have a conflict, maybe send the question directly to Matt as a first, and then if if Matt thinks it needs to be sent further up the chain, Matt will then send it to the town's legal counsel because really that's that's their job, you know, to 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 help suss out the the conflicts and they will be very limited. And, and in terms of people also ask about the financial impact question, I, I mean, we, we, we were mentioning realtors earlier. This is a question that comes up. Okay, well, what if there's an agent that also happens to be in my firm and they've got a proposal? Unless you guys are limited partners on the same project, you know, there, there is technically really no conflict there. So, like, if I'm building homes and a subdivision comes up, I don't have – if I have no financial and they're not a family member, I don't have to recuse myself. No. Just because I'm doing the same business as what's coming up, that does not mean I have to refuse myself. I don't believe so, but I'm not the, the town's legal count. We had this – we had a similar issue to this um, in the town of Surf City uh, regarding marinas. Uh, a board member had a marina there. Uh, he got his approved, and then he uh, was a sole member that voted no on a new one coming in, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> which was which was interesting. <laughs> but um, it, but the the sentiment was that there there generally was not to, not a conflict yep. uh, even even on that. Um, again, send it up the chain to ask uh, if you have a question, and it doesn't. I mean. I will always say if there's a question and, and you guys will sort of know, it's probably best just to recuse yourself. I mean, it doesn't mean you obviously want to make sure you got a quorum to vote, but it doesn't hurt, hurt to recuse yourself. Thank you. Open meeting laws. Um, these are established in statute. Uh, effectively, it, it, it is, I'll read this, it's a public policy of North Carolina that the hearings, deliberations, and actions of these bodies be conducted openly. Um, so that means that, you know, we're in a, we're in a uh, official meeting here today. It was advertised and noticed. Anyone can show up um, and attend the meeting. Um, one thing that often folks may or may not realize is you're not mandated to have public comment. So um, you're not, you're, you're not, 
you don't have to allow someone to speak in the public if you don't want. And I think it's a good thing to do that, but um, sometimes folks forget that. An official meeting is, is a pretty broad definition. So it's a meeting assembly or gathering together at any time or place. And the, if you'll see there, including teleconference or electronic conference, which means group text message, Facebook group message, what email uh, message, uh, with a majority of the members for the purpose of conducting hearings, participating in deliberations, or voting upon or otherwise transacting the public business within the jurisdiction of the public body. Um, and I'll well, I'll, I'll touch on this in a minute. But um, yes, sir. Question: You mentioned Facebook. Say the majority of town councils on Oak Island Oak locals and they start discussing stuff is that what you're talking about or <sighs> that's a tricky one I mean if all of them are, are discussing the same topic and there's a majority of them discussing the same topic that's probably a no-no uh, but I don't there's a very fine line there um, within you know uh, First Amendment rights and free speech, et cetera. But um, if it's specifically to deliberate a matter that is before the council and the majority of them are providing their comments on it, that's that probably pretty close to constitutes what I would consider to be an official meeting. But I'm not going to get into the middle of, <laughs> of, of, of the Facebook uh business um and so it, one of the things that happened okay in in our beach towns uh you know they're small <coughs> smaller towns what if everybody's at a at a social event concert etc totally fine just just don't go huddle in a corner and talk about the subdivision proposal that's uh getting ready to come up before you guys um group text messages don't do those either um, if it is about um, business before the town. Email communication. Generally, I would say, I don't know how it works here, but don't reply all. If you need to send something, send it to Matt or Lisa, and they will distribute it um, to whoever it needs to go to. And the other part of this, and I, I don't have a slide on this, is... Even though, let's just say, even if it's, if it's between two of you, it doesn't constitute an, a, 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 an official meeting, but there is email communication or text communication. That's still a public record. So, uh, you know, if I feel like if, if I'm a developer or an applicant and I, and I think that you guys are engaged in some type of deliberation between a minority of you guys, I can send to Lisa uh, a public records request and... It can, I can pull all the records in any email communication that you guys have. Um, and so just think about that anytime that you're about to send off an email, whether or not you would want whatever it is you're sending to show up in the paper somewhere or in a courtroom. And I say, I got a question about yes, that. <laughs> when you said that they could subpoena or open record emails, is that every email that comes into my inbox? Or specific ones? Just specific ones between you and, and town staff or you and another board member. Okay, because see, we, we had this discussion and uh, we had an open rec open records request in Alamance County where I came from. Mm -hmm. And that's why all the planning board members and every other advisory board had their own email, county emails going forward just in case that ever came up. We're here, we use our personal, personal. email. Yeah. Well, I set up one just for this, but that's because I don't believe in we're only going to get certain emails. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I don't, it, that's a difficult thing to do. Um, and public records requests can be very broad too. Um, but um, yeah, just it, I, I'm not saying to be, I'm not telling you to be secretive, but you know, if, if you really have got some serious question, then you know just pick up the phone and call. It's it's not a not a bad way to handle things. 
Text messaging is also subject to public records requests. <laughs> but you said a majority. No, a pub, you create, there's two different things. There's official meeting, which is a majority, and then there's a public record. Okay. And if you text Matt or Lisa or Steve, you've created a public record, and your phone is then subject to a public records request. Is that? All right. Glad to end on a, on a upbeat, <laughs> upbeat <laughs> topic. <laughs> Any other questions that you guys have? I really appreciate you guys having me. Anything else for Wes? Wes, really thank you so much for being with us. As yes. always, your information is um, is valuable, and it's a good reminder for those who've seen the, seen the information before. Yes, yes. Thank you all for, for sitting through it again. I think I was here a little over a year ago. So, um, All right. Thank you so much. Good to see everybody. Thanks, Wes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so moving on, the next uh, item on our agenda is old business. Um, when we met last meeting, we didn't know whether or not we would have any cases come before us for approval, so we didn't anticipate that we might have time in this meeting to talk about the table of uses, and as such, we had scheduled a special meeting uh, for next Monday, the twentieth, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit a little bit later. Um, our information on the table of uses starts on page eleven in your agenda packet. And Matt, if you will provide us an overview of the new information you've provided for us to look at today. Absolutely. Um, so uh, last month uh, you had a. <laughs> the beginning of a red line draft of the table of uses um, uh, based on some of the discussion we had had and based on the uh, efforts to consolidate some of these uses. Um, <laughs> staff went through uh, and attempted to, to finish that, so we kind of last month uh, stopped around, uh, I think we made it through recreation. Um, so we started working through residential, retail sales and services, uh, and then um, the final section is transportation, warehousing, other uses. Um, also tried to incorporate uh, as much of the discussion around special uses that uh, I could find in our notes. Um, so really uh, the, the changes to the first half should be uh, things that uh, the board talked about, you know, wanting to look at the supplemental regulations or should it be a SS, that kind of thing. Um, and then starting at the residential should be uh, some new consolidation efforts as well as those other things. Um, I certainly tried to get everything I, I could from the last discussion, but it's, there's a lot in here. So certainly if I missed something that, you know, uh, we've talked about before, uh, that's the benefit of having so many eyes on it. So definitely let me know. Um, so we've got that red line draft in there. Um, there's also, uh, after, shortly after that, uh, a clean version of those changes. Um, so that's what it would look like, barring any additional feedback or changes that the board might have today. Um, so that continues on to page 33 uh, is the end of that. Um, then we move into the definitions and then supplemental regulations. I know there was some discussion last month about uh, if there's any, that there may be some additional discussion uh, around those issues. Um, so we didn't focus on changing any of those because I wanted to hear your feedback first um, before we continued to, to chug along drafting some of that stuff. Um, I wanted to hear your feedback on what we had in front of you last, last month. Um, so certainly, uh, I'd leave it up to the, the board for any discussion you might have, any feedback you might have. Um, welcome to, uh, like I said, if, if I missed anything or anything needs to change or if there's, you know, supplemental regulations that you'd like to see developed or changed or anything like that, um, definitely uh, glad to hear that uh, and continue work on this, on, on these changes. So, um, 
I realized there was a lot of data to capture and we had notes from uh, meetings going back as far as July. Mm -hmm. um, I started comparing my notes from July with the clean copy of the table of uses that we have now and notice that there are some uh, changes that haven't been picked up. Yeah. I don't know if it's beneficial to go through those line item by line item, or is it better to just send you kind of a list? Uh, what's going to be the easiest way for you to capture those things? Um, there, I'm just trying to think. Uh, so there's a couple of ways we could do it. Um, as you just mentioned, you, you could go ahead and, and list them out now, and I'll be happy to, to go back and uh, fix those for our next meeting. Um, if you prefer to send me a list, uh, I can definitely incorporate those at our next review either way and, and help make sure I outline for everybody what those were. Um, it's really the pleasure of the board at, at this point. Uh, a list is certainly helpful for me when I'm drafting, but also uh, Lisa keeps pretty good minutes, so if we talk about it here in the meeting, I should be able to refer back to those as well. Okay. I didn't go all the way through the um, the condensed table. Once I noticed there was a few, I thought I would just, sure. you know, just wait and see what your what your pleasure was and and what I would help work you the way. most. Um, I guess what <laughs> I would good. ask everybody to do is take minutes that you have and the table, the clean table that Matt has provided and start to check through those mm -hmm. and see, like you said, it's helpful to have several sets of eyes on these. I know I've overlooked some things. For example, um, under educational, which is on page 25 of the clean, the clean copy, um, we had made a note to strike those from the CB district and keep them in the CLD district and change it from an S to an SS. Um, likewise, um, was that colleges, universities, and community colleges? Right. Okay. Right. Um, if you look down uh, prior to the um, consolidation and cleanup of the table, we had libraries grouped as public or private in the new table. Matt has broken those out. Um, and I think the reason for that was because we talked about the free libraries, and I'm assuming those would be considered under private yeah, libraries. So, uh, so what would happen there, um, you'll notice that uh, private libraries is a PS in certain residential districts. What we would do is develop supplemental regulations that would essentially require those to be in the form of those book box free libraries. So we'd set a height, size, Okay. based on those so that even though it's a PS, the only thing you could actually do with it is those little book boxes. You couldn't use that PS to say, oh, I'm going to build a, you know, 2,000 square foot library or anything like that. But um, since they're, you know, essentially small, you know, you don't want those folks that want to put one up that have to go through a special, special use permit hearing or anything like that. Um, yeah, so... When we had libraries listed as public or private, we and they were special uses in the residential districts, we had taken uh, all of the, we had changed all of those, I believe, to PSs. Okay. So from the S to the PS, and then, of course, they were permitted in the CB district and the, um, the CLD district. So th those were just a few that started to catch my eye as I went through here. Yeah. Um, so I would ask that everyone take the time to sit down and look at, at minutes that you have. Some of these go back to July. You might also, you should also have those minutes since we came on board in August. Mm -hmm. And um, let's create a um, collective list. And uh, Madam Clerk, would it be acceptable for the members to send their list to me and then I could compile it so we remove any duplications and... Yeah, that'd be fine. It'd be if I would appreciate being copied on it. Okay. List. Yeah. Yep. Very Just good. So, so if you would um, create those create those lists by comparing our new table versus any notes you have from minutes or notes you have from meetings, yep. and let's see if we can 
uh, compile a complete list for Matt to work from. Um, he, you know, working on the table of uses is not his full-time job, so <laughs> any help that we can give him, I think, will be um, beneficial. With that being said, um, I had asked last month for folks to go through the definitions and see if there was anything glaring that we had perhaps overlooked, any definition that we might need that was overlooked. Um, and if you had a chance to do that, does anybody have anything for Matt that we need to find a definition for? Yeah, and I'll add on to that. Um, you know, we have a, a couple in here that were added, but uh, it doesn't reflect the additional consolidation that happened between last month and this month. So there's okay. definitely going to be some more changes on my end. But if there, as you just mentioned, if there's anything out there that you're like, oh, we got to do this, def okay. definitely let her rip for sure. So unless you have something to, pr uh, to bring forth today, then I would recommend that be part of the list that you create um, and, and send to me and we can consolidate it. And, um, and get it to Matt. Absolutely. And then finally, on the, um, I know you've been waiting, Matt, on some direction for the supplemental regulations. It, it seems to me that it'll be most helpful to finalize the table and then identify and create a list of areas where we need supplemental regulations yeah. or where we need to review. <coughs> because our goal was to remove as many of the S's as possible, mm -hmm. turning them into to supplemental use, you know, special uses with supplemental regulations, if we couldn't eliminate them all together. Yeah, that, that's absolutely a uh, uh, perfectly fine way to work through this. The, the intention of me, uh, you know, crafting and giving you some example supplemental regulations was really to get you all thinking about it you know, here's some things that we could do, here's some strategies that we could take. So, um, you know, like like the other things, it's not meant to be final and, and you know, this is the draft of it. Um, it's really just to, to kind of introduce some of those concepts that we haven't had in the past to, to get you guys thinking about, you know, some of these newer consolidated uses, what kind of things do we want to see out here, uh, and to get any feedback as far as, well, this might make sense or this doesn't, or you know, maybe this is a general direction we'd like to go in or not. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, it, unless there's specific feedback on these, you know, that, that's definitely a way to, to break it all down and say, hey, here's the table, now let's I think know, once we have a comprehensive it. list, mm -hmm. um, It'll be easier than trying to piecemeal it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, together. Anybody have any general comments or questions about how we're proceeding? Good. Mm. Um, Madam Clerk, would this be the appropriate time to talk about the special, uh, the special meeting that we had scheduled for Monday? Um, well, I think you were going to recess, but um, <coughs> yeah, we were going to. Adjourn to a, mm -hmm. a time and place certain. I've talked to Mr. Kirkland and I want to uh, get input from the board, but it seems that since today is Thursday, we have a good bit of work to do as a board on our own. Uh, obviously, Matt's not going to have the information to make the changes and have it ready for Monday. So, my recommendation would be to not have that meeting on Monday, but indeed look for something. Um, just a little bit further out to give us time to get this material together and uh, and get it to Matt and give him time to... It, it, that kind of dovetails into your discussion about <coughs> rescheduling the February or the December meeting. Right. Right. You know, if depending on when that gets set, it may be that, you know, we can give you guys a couple of weeks to review, have... Madam Chair, consolidate everything into a list and get that back to me, and then I have a few days to to get it worked on and, and put into your agenda packet for the for the December meeting. But it really depends on what y'all's pleasure is to as far as rescheduling that one goes. Okay, too. Very, very good point. Thanks for bringing that up. So, yeah. um, just to uh, jump ahead for a second, our regular December meeting is scheduled for Thursday, December the twenty first, and that is just a day before the. <laughs> Uh, holiday weekend with Christmas and such and given that a lot of folks may be traveling or having folks come into town 
I just wanted to see if there was a desire to um, try to back that meeting up a day or two or three with something that works for staff's um, schedule. So is, is, is there consensus that we'd like to try to find a, an earlier date that week? I agree. Mm -hmm. If further back would probably be better for everybody. Okay, so then Madam Clerk, what would say Monday or Tuesday look like for you? Any, any day is fine. Okay, is there, a, is there a preference for anybody with their schedule on a Monday or a Tuesday? Um, That's Morgan, I'm seeing the... <laughs> I'd rather do it on the 18th. Monday is better for me. How about the 11th? I'm gonna have a house full of grandkids that week. I don't, I, I don't know that we can go back the 11th. That's just in the time when staff is trying to get ready for council meeting. Um, <clears throat> we could just move it back a week and do the 14th. That's also on a Thursday. Um, and looking at our schedule um, and what we just discussed today. So let's say um, you guys maybe took to the end of November to get stuff to Madam Chair and Madam Chair get that to me. Um, that would give me a, a few days to put together your agenda and try to consolidate, try to get that as much into draft as possible and get your agenda published in time for the, the 14th. But that's just an, any time after that is probably okay with me. 14th's good for me. Brooks, Mr. Bradley. 14th's fine with me. Like, uh, that should work too. Yes. And Madam Clark, that works. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Same time. We need a, a motion to change that date. Okay, so um, is there any further discussion? If not, I would entertain a motion to change our December 21st meeting to 9 o'clock on December the 14th. I make a motion. Okay, Ms. Morgan, second. Second. Mr. Bradley, all in favor? Okay, so we'll make a note that's changed to December the 14th. And then um, the November 20th is canceled. November 20th is canceled, and given, given that we're going to move the uh, regular meeting back to the 14th, we're compressing, we're compressing everything, and we all have a fair amount of homework to do, so I don't see any point in trying to schedule another special meeting between now and December the 14th. Matt, uh, given the new meeting date, what would what would our final submittal date be for me to get the information to uh, you? If you can get it to me by the 1st of December, that would give me a few days to, to get cracking on drafting those changes and getting it back in front of you. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, very that good. That gives you all a couple of weeks, too, so. Um, given that, and given that it'll probably take me a day or so to yeah. compile everybody's information, if you all could get your information to me by <coughs> Tuesday the 28th, Hopefully that gives you um, a few days before the holiday and a few days after. Um, and again, we're looking to pick up anything that's been discussed at a meeting in the minutes or any um, notes that you have that we can compile and give to Matt so that his task, so he doesn't have to sit and try to pull everything together, I think that'll um, hopefully be beneficial to him. So it is would. everybody okay with those? Yeah, and, and any questions we have on the definitions? And then review yeah, any, all definitions. Any, any questions or any definitions that you, if you see, you, you know, you're looking through it and you say, wait, I don't see something for, Go. you know. Just let them rip. <laughs> I, I think it's a pretty comprehensive list. It's, you know, it's 40, 40 pages, but there may be something um, or if you think a definition is not clear, I know Matt has used standard definitions for these, so it's not something he just sat down and made up. Yeah, and I, yeah, you don't have to come up with a definition, but if you see a, a trouble item or something like that, definitely let me know, and I can research uh, to try to find either a better fit or a new definition for an item. But don't don't feel like you have to sit at home and write one yourself. I'll help you out with that. Oh, mine I think would be good. Just it's just an and. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think it needs a slash or, but that's just or. me. Okay. So if you all will um, just compile that information, you can send it to me in a Word document. Hopefully that way I can cut and paste everything. And if you'll please be sure to uh, copy Madam Clerk on that. That would be that would be great. 
So we sort of went ahead and jumped into new business by discussing the December meeting, so we have that taken care of. Um, so we'll next go to uh, board reports, and we'll start with you, Mr. Brooks. Nothing, Madam Chair. Mr. Bradley. I am good. Thank you. Okay. This morning. Nothing here. Okay. Mr. Person. Okay. Mr. Pittman. Okay. Um, well, I'll just say something briefly. Given that um, we have canceled the special meeting for November, and given that the um, planning board meeting in November will be two days after the council meeting, this is effectively my last formal meeting with the um, planning board. And so I just want to say that I sincerely appreciate staff's dedication to the work we do. Um, they do have full-time jobs other than um, helping the planning board, and so we often ask a lot, and I'm uh, greatly appreciative of the work that they do, and, and Madam Clerk for helping me to uh, stay in, in the boundaries and uh, knowing what the procedures are. You've been a great help for that. I also want to thank the members of this board for your contributions. Um, working on the planning board is difficult. It's hard to please everybody. There are lots of moving pieces, lots of nuances to understand, and sometimes it may feel like a thankless job, but I'm grateful for your willingness to uh, participate and give of your time and your expertise uh, for our town. So um, please accept my gratitude uh, to all of you for your commitment. We'll go to uh, staff reports, Mr. Kirkland. Yeah, just a couple of brief reports. Uh, the first is our uh, running list of items uh, that are awaiting council consideration. I don't have any changes uh, there from the previous month. Uh, a couple of staff updates for the planning board. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, and you're all well aware, uh, Planet Geo came uh, and presented the results of the tree canopy assessment. Uh, that's not quite closed out yet because we have, uh, as you may have noticed, they mentioned uh, Tree Plotter, which is a GIS service that all this data actually goes into. So they're uploading that data there. Once that finished product is out, that'll be a resource for folks to use to say, oh, you know, like he said in the presentation, down to the parcel level, this is what the change was in these. Uh, the time periods that they've got. Um, <clears throat> the town council uh, at their meeting on Tuesday also approved a request for proposals to update the comprehensive land use plan. Uh, <clears throat> I was, as I mentioned, I was out of the office yesterday with a sick little boy, but I'm gonna send that out today uh, to make sure that that's published appropriately. But I'm happy to say we've had, believe now four firms reach out to us want additional information so hopefully that'll be a successful request and we'll get some good proposals out of that um, that's going to be uh, due on the 15th of December so it'll be shortly after our our meeting um, with the new date but uh, council will hopefully be looking at some proposals for that in January uh, and moving ahead. It's a very exciting project for the town. Um, comprehensive plans, if you never participated in one, are a lot of public engagement, uh, which is uh, really great. Uh, hopefully we have a good turnout for all that. Um, we've been working with the county to schedule a uh, presentation of the Wellhead Protection Overlay District um, that we've discussed a couple of times here. Um, I'm waiting to hear back. Uh, received one response from the county, uh, and I'm working on getting another response to nail down that date um, for sure, but that's where that one's at. Uh, a couple of uh, really good training, staff training updates. Um, I didn't know this at the time this was published, uh, but uh, uh, Deidre Horn and Brady Golden uh, recently passed their exam to become uh, certified zoning officials in the state of North Carolina. Uh, so we now have three on staff in the planning department, uh, which I'd have to check, but might be the most we've ever had in the department. So really proud of them. That's a, a strenuous course and a strenuous exam. Uh, and one of our staff members was fighting through COVID and took the last part remotely and did the test remotely and did really well. So very proud of that effort on their parts. Uh, in addition, Courtney, our CAMA LPO floodplain administrator, went to a course on coastal construction and retrofit that was put on by the 
North Carolina Department of Public Safety Emergency Management in Newburn. Uh, as you might imagine, that's very relevant to us here, <laughs> coastal construction and retrofit. So uh, she said it was a really good course. Uh, and uh, we also had uh, Steve Edwards, who's the building director, attend that course as well. Um, and then finally, uh, Brady Golden, our planner one, is with uh, the town manager and a couple of elected officials at the NC Byway Conference up in Wilmington, which deals with inlets, waterways, accesses, et cetera. Um, so we've got some, some good staff events that have been going on lately trying to build that capacity here in the department to, to handle a bunch of different issues. So uh, that's all I have for you for staff reports today. But if you have any questions or need anything, definitely, definitely let me know. Anything uh, for Matt on his report? I just have a question. Sure. So, um, I understand we're going to be taking up the tree ordinance. Is that correct? Or? Um, so, I, I think we're that there was some general consensus among council that they wanted planning board to to re review that. Um, be, working with the, the town administration to make sure that's firm and then if that's the case, if that's their direction, then yeah, that's what we'll be doing. So would that maybe be December or January? Or? Uh, I would anticipate it in the near future. Like I said, mm -hmm. I've got to nail that down to make sure that, that, was, that that's what council as a whole is the consensus that they want to do. But yeah, I'll, I'll put it as soon as I have that information, I'll put it right back on. So I would, I would look at it coming back pretty quick. Thank you, Matt, and uh, congratulations to your folks for their accomplishments. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, unless anybody has anything for the good of the order, um, I think that concludes our business for today. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Bradley, second? All of you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Pick one. Um, and uh, if you're in agreement, please vote. Okay, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Steve.